Good afternoon, I'm Milton Walker with the Midday News. A special welcome if you're watching on OneSpotMedia.com. Tensions are high in Cockburn, Penn St. Andrew after a man was reportedly shot dead by the police this morning. Residents set fire to debris and blocked the Waltham Park, Hagley Park Road intersection in protest. The residents also blocked roads in the community, resulting in a traffic pileup. The circumstances which led to the killing are not known. Over in Manchester, the police are report probing the murder of a woman in Harty's district on Wednesday night. 34-year-old Shanalee Bailey was found dead inside her home yesterday. The details in this report. Police vehicles and a crowd in a section of the Harty's district in Manchester Thursday morning. All signs of a tragedy that struck the entire community. It was the murder scene of 34-year-old Shanalee Bailey. It's believed that Miss Bailey was murdered from Wednesday night. But it was not until Thursday morning that her three-year-old daughter told the residents that her mother was not waking up. The local girl is smart, very intelligent, because I, I what she said, tick my brain, why me? Look at my friend and say, yo, make me go look because the local girl is smart and something all right. Checks were made and Miss Bailey's body was found inside this house, lying face down in a pool of blood. She lived with four of her children. The police were later called to the scene. Hours later, residents attacked and beat Shanalee's common-law husband in an adjoining community. He was rescued by the police. God Almighty, man, what do you mean, man? I four, I four local baby, she's dead left, you know. And not even four or five, you know, because one of them, one of them, government went to one of them. So she had four with her. So they may pick her up without a, without a mother, basically without a father too. They come with her if you come, you know, because she knows she had two years ago, then kill the mother. And this come to the daughter. Yo, yo, God Almighty, man, me nervous, man, me, oh, me, me, I change my bridges, me can't, me, me, me can't, me can't cope, God, me can't cope. The police have not charged Miss Bailey's husband with any crime. Giovanni Dennis, TVJ News. And the Jamaica Constabulary Force says efforts are being made to equip its members with body cameras in order to carry out their jobs effectively. O'Shane Masters reports. With police officers being accused of using excessive and deadly force, there have been renewed calls for them to be equipped with body cameras. This measure will see activities of the security force being recorded and stored on a server and will be watched by a senior member on a daily basis. The issue of body cameras came up again last month following the shooting death of Susan Bogle, a disabled woman in August on St. Andrew, allegedly by members of a Jamaica Defence Force. When asked about the use of body cameras on military operations, Chief of General Rocky Meade said that the cameras that were previously procured were insufficient for the type of job. He says new body cameras are now being tested by the JDF. That's the same for the Jamaica Constabulary Force, the JCF. Police Commissioner Major General Anthony Anderson, who was speaking at a JCF press briefing on Thursday, said they have been testing body cameras since last month. He says they have also purchased a server, which will store data from the body cameras. However, there's a challenge. The people who are supposed to come in and commission it have not been able to do so yet because our borders are closed. And so we are working on that. It's started. It's a long process. Major General Anderson says there's a lot which needs to be worked out as the number of body cameras that are needed for the JCF alone is massive. We cannot afford to get it wrong. We have to take it. We have to do this in a very structured way, very step by step. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. Meanwhile, the police commission is reporting a reduction in major crime so far this year compared to 2019. But he says while there's a decline, it's nothing significant. It is unfortunate that we have not been able to manage this aspect of our society as well as we should. It is unfortunate that within families, within communities and within neighborhoods that we can't resolve these matters in a better way. Meanwhile, Deputy Police Commissioner in charge of operations, Clifford Blake, says a number of communities are now on the JCF's radar due to rising violence. One of those communities is August Town in St. Andrew. We have recently seen some fear of violence in August Town, which has forced us to deploy additional resources into that community. 
Also, we do have concerns about ongoing criminal activities in areas within Kingston Western Division and the St. Andrew South Division. A man who is mentally challenged is now in police custody after he threatened to kill a resident of Northampton in St. Elizabeth on Wednesday. The victim, Patrick Smith, who is a taxi operator, was at his home about 9.30 when the incident happened. I noticed him asked train fan a day before or so. Anyway, me and Licky Cairns, if you come out, if you come out, if you want to kill me, you want to kill me, if you come out. So anyway, my mother, something if you come out, something if you come out. I mean, I call out for help, I call me at the same time, everybody else, and people don't come. The man of unsound mind also used a machete to vandalise Mr. Smith's car before he attempted to set the house on fire. In the, in the court, the glass, with an object when he come out. And when he come around that side, I look through in the, you know, to naked back or something, come out, come out now, come out now. The man them saying, go inside there and light the mattress. After all, they run out. And then they will find him a bottom tent and power house stop and find him last night. Two units from the Santa Cruz Fire Brigade managed to extinguish the blaze. However, the man was later taken into custody by the police. We take a break now on Midday News. We'll be right back. Hi there, I'm Simon Preston from TVJ. Thank you very much for watching our YouTube channel. To see our latest videos and also to see live events, click here. To see our full videos on onespotmedia.com, click here. Welcome back, continuing the news. As the country moves to relax some of the COVID-19 protocols, the health ministry is calling on Jamaicans to remain responsible to prevent a second wave of the disease. Dashan Hendricks tells us more. People have been getting complacent and not strictly observing mask wearing as was the case in the early stages of COVID-19 in Jamaica. And as the country relaxes some of the restrictions to allow for the economy to recover, this warning from the health minister. The threat is still very real. And with each lifting of restrictions, the threat becomes even more possible to materialize into a reality. He told Jamaicans to keep focus on the measures to contain the spread of COVID-19, even as they enjoy greater freedoms, such as reduced curfew hours and the ability to return to work. In the near future, other protocols will be reviewed, such as the closure of beaches and other places of amusement. At the same time, the tourism sector is being reopened. We cannot guarantee absolute or normal our usual freedoms, which clearly is the desire of all of us as a, in a free society, and also guarantee absolute protection from COVID. Um, every decision has associated risks. And that's why we think that the everyone counts theme of getting persons to take personal responsibility. The protocols that have been established, we must enforce them. Uh, the hospital system has to be prepared to deal with critical cases and that process has to continue in the months ahead. Still another eye-opening reason to take precautions, this time from the chief epidemiologist in the Ministry of Health, Dr. Karen Webster Carr, especially in light of individuals who may look at Jamaica's low rate of COVID-19 infections and think there's nothing to worry about. Having confirmed cases is not the total picture of persons. So we may have more persons who would have had um, COVID-19 than can be confirmed. Up to yesterday, the nation recorded 591 confirmed cases of COVID-19. The majority, 368, had recovered, while there are 10 deaths. The projection is that up to 2.6 million people could contract an upper respiratory tract disease this year, including COVID-19. Dashen Hendricks, TVJ News. In the meantime, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Health, Dunstan Brand, says additional locations are being identified for the coronavirus quarantine facilities as the Health Ministry's arrangement with the Bahia Principe Hotel in St. Anne ended yesterday. The protocols, um, as you know, have been adjusted 
and we are making alternative arrangements for quarantine. Uh, for persons who are in isolation, the, the uh, arrangement is that each region will identify appropriate venues within their region to um, continue the isolation of persons who are still testing, who still have a positive result from their tests. In the KSA region, we have concluded negotiations with 138 Living, um, uh, Student Living, 138 Student li Living, and our arrangement is for the Southeast region with the um, 138 Living um, group. The Integrity Commission has notified the government it will be thoroughly examining expenditure done in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Recently appointed Executive Director of the Commission, Greg Christie, wrote to the Permanent Secretaries and Principal Accounting Officers on Tuesday to outline the oversight body's intention. Prime Minister Andrew Holness, Minister of Finance Dr. Nigel Clark and Minister of Health Dr. Christopher Tofton were also copied on the letter. More in this report from Debbie Ann Wright. Last month, Dr. Nigel Clark told the House of Representatives the government was allocating more than $26 billion to the COVID-19 response. Most of that allocation was set to go to the government's care program and the health ministry. Mr. Christie says he notes that it has been reported that the health ministry had already spent $2.5 billion of the $2.8 billion it was initially allocated. He says the commission is aware numerous other public entities have expended funds and in in doing so, would have awarded a wide variety of contracts and will continue to do so in the foreseeable future. He adds that several donations and grants totaling several million dollars have reportedly been received by public bodies and officials from private sector entities and individuals. Mr. Christie says given the unprecedented levels of expenditure committed to fighting the pandemic over the past few months, the adverse fiscal implications of COVID-19, and the additional funds the government intends to spend, the Commission must fulfill its statutory obligations by responding in a similarly heightened manner. He explains that the Commission's monitoring program will seek to ensure there is integrity, accountability and independent oversight in the government's COVID-19 expenditure and contract awards. The letter also outlined that the Commission's Director of Investigations will soon request information from all pertinent ministries and agencies to facilitate the oversight process. Residents of some southwest Clarendon communities say the large number of jobs they were expecting from the construction of the extension of Highway 2000 in the parish have not materialized so far. There is also a call from one elected representative for those employed on the project to be paid properly. More in this report from O'Shane Masters. Close to 200 million US dollars is to be spent to build a highway linking Clarendon to Manchester. Budgeted in that money are funds for labor, as it is expected to be a labor-intensive three-year project. But stakeholders are not seeing the uptick in jobs they expected from the project. When we visited sections of the construction site in Yorktown, we observed some young men sitting around. They say they are looking for jobs. They told TVJ News they have been visiting the site for the last few days, hoping to pick up a job. But nothing yet. Fine, yesterday we see what we did, I go and see what I go and see, you know. I try to look peace and work. I see, like, you think I go and good, see, you know, I'm not right, I go and good, but they must say it's a move slow up and thing, you know, so I eat with us, I come here at the time and I see what I go on, you know. Yeah, when I write time, cause, you know, everybody has to try to do something, you know, get out of the students, you know, you know. Other residents are more fortunate and have landed jobs or have secured earning opportunities by setting up stalls to sell snacks and other supplies to workers. Most of the people are in a client than now. Most of the people So I have opportunity like this, I know. To get, that be nice everybody. Can't have to come in here pocket. The councillor for the Yorktown division is Ufel Purcell. He is far from happy with the distribution of employment so far in the project. You cannot have unemployment and persons are going to just come and tell you that they are going to pay citizens $285 per, per hour. That is less than $3,000 a 
it, it, it can't work. They need to look very seriously on how much. I, I think, for example, what they call the GRC rate is somewhere in the region about $3,500. So therefore, I believe that nothing less than that should be paid because this is Jamaica, and with all respect, we need the investment, but we need to abide by the laws of Jamaica. And then uh, there are persons who don't want to work but want to collect money, the criminal elements, namely extortionists. The councillor says measures are in place to prevent this activity from affecting the project. So far we, are, we, 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 we have been doing fairly well, but I know that is not something that we can look and left lightly. Right? So the police are well informed, they know of the situations, they know the areas very well, and I think they are going to make certain that whatever is to happen will happen to make certain that the project go on as safely as possible. The project will extend the east-west highway from Maypen in Clarendon to Williamsville in Manchester. It's projected to finish in 2022. O'Shane Masters, TVJ News. As students across the country get ready to sit their CAPE and CSEC exams, school administrators have been kept busy preparing for a limited resumption of classes. The education system has been severely impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, with schools forced to close as part of measures to fight the coronavirus. Prince Moore reports. Thermometers, hand sanitizers, physical distancing signs. In fact, signs are everywhere. All of this as students return to school to prepare for CSEC and CAPE exams. Principal at the Seafort High School, Colbert Thomas, says measures will be in place when classes resume on Monday. We are putting in the necessary uh, guidelines, uh, safety measures, uh, both on the corridors and also in the classroom. Mr. Thomas also says that there will be periodic cleaning of the classrooms. We have been doing cleaning continually, and the, once the, the classrooms are clean, they are locked. So nobody will be able to have access to them until when they are ready for the students. I have encouraged my staff here at Seaford High School to ensure that we take every precaution that is necessary to keep this institution safe. Over at the St. Elizabeth Technical High School, Principal Keith Wellington told TVJ News that the institution had started to prepare long before the date for the limited reopening of school was announced. Some students have been attending school as they finalize SBA submissions. Mr. Wellington says this was necessary for those who wanted to complete their practical work. A few of them, probably about 30 or so of them, wanted the opportunity to complete that, come in and complete their practical work. And we have allowed them to because we think that we were in a position to facilitate them in a safe environment. He explained that the student attendance over the last few weeks has been used to measure how they would react to the new normal. As soon as school closed, we started the process of ensuring that school would be ready whenever we were expected to. At Cumberland High School in Portmore, St. Catherine, Principal Darren Henry says he's expecting little over 100 students to return next week. Students and staff will be screened. Mr. Henry adds that COVID-19 may negatively affect the students' performances in the upcoming exams and as such, the school will be providing psychological support to aid the teaching and learning process. The, the three-week window, which opens as of June 8th, will allow us to interface with our students who we are preparing for the CSEC examinations. Um, certainly, we have developed our own timetable, and that timetable um, includes psychosocial support for staff and for students. We know that the, the time they have been away from the actual physical environment, that will likely impact their performance. He also spoke of plans to regulate vending outside the school. We are engaging them in some discussions now because certainly they are an important part of the school community. Um, we have not taken a decision not to accommodate them, but certainly we are engaging them in those discussions. And at least by the end of the week, we, we will know where to go. But we're not going to be um, blocking out our vendors because they, are, they have been crucial to us and they will continue to be crucial in school advancement. Prince Moore, TVJ News. In sports, Olympian... Alea Atkinson has revealed that she has put retirement plans on hold due to the crippling effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on sporting activities around the globe. Here's Spencer Darlington with that story. 
Atkinson, who has represented Jamaica in swimming at four Olympic Games, had planned to make Tokyo 2020 her last Olympic appearance in the pool. However, with the Games being pushed back to 2021 due to the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, the 31-year-old, whose strongest event is the 100-meter breaststroke, has had to adjust her retirement plans by a year and a half. Well, I was changing my mindset because Olympics was supposed to be this year. And like Sharon, I was going to retire this year, more than likely. So <laughs> it changes a lot. Like, what do you do now? Um, for me, I decided to keep on going and you know, what else was left. Um, I did have a competition in December of this year, but that now has been cancelled as well. Atkinson added that she has placed a special emphasis on certain areas of her craft, such as extra running and injury prevention techniques during the current out-of-competition period. Meanwhile, Rio Olympics double sprint champion Elaine thompson Hira says she has gotten over a nagging injury which has plagued her for the past few seasons, adding that the postponement of the Olympics has given her extra time to heal. I was sad at first, but now that I got a chance to recover fully from the Achilles injury because I started really late and I said to myself, I had to probably had to rush go to national trials let me say and if my own my main goal if i didn't know top three for me this year because i started late top three and then i take it from there and i'm training now so i'm, I'm feeling great the 27 year old sprinter said the truncated season could also have an effect on her earning power for next year my contract ends december so i was looking forward for this year to see what i could pull through this year but I have to just continue to work hard and just hope for the best and just see what next year brings. The MVP track club athlete said she also has fears about traveling if and when international competition resumes this year. Both Tom Sahira and Atkinson were among the guests during Thursday's Olympians Association of Jamaica panel discussion where the topic was outlast the breakout, keeping your competitive edge during the pandemic. The discussion was hosted by three-time Olympian and executive member of the Olympians Association of Jamaica, Sharon Simpson. Spencer Darlington, TVJ Sports. And that's the Midday News. I'm Milton Walker. Join us at 7 for Primetime News on behalf of the news, sports and production teams. Have a good afternoon.